A good story well told has the power to open us up to new ways of thinking, give us insight into the experiences of others, and ultimately make us more connected. The more connected we are, the more impact we can make together. This is the mission behind Amaze, the online platform known for raising hundreds of millions of dollars for charity by raffling once-in-a-lifetime experiences. They are changing the game. Chances are you've seen an Amaze video come across your social media. They are so engaging. Whether the unique experience is blowing up tanks with Arnold Schwarzenegger, watching the series finale of Breaking Bad with its stars, getting the chance to hang out with Iron Man, or making a cameo appearance in the new Star Wars film, each campaign has shaken up the traditional fundraising model in a way that feels fresh. I am so excited to share that the CEO and co-founder of Omaze, Ryan Cummins, is my guest on the podcast today. Ryan and his best friend, Matt, received their MBAs from Stanford and worked together as executive producers for the Clinton Foundation. They dreamed up the idea for Omaze after they attended a charity auction when they were both broke college students. They realized really quickly that they would never be able to afford to win any of the auctions, and they decided to flip the whole model on its head, and now the rest is history. The work Brian has done with more than 150 charities in more than 175 countries is something that has disrupted the entire philanthropic space. He's going to share about all of that today and dive deep into the intersection of philanthropy and storytelling and why that matters. I am Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. Sounds Good is not your typical three steps to success podcast. We don't host this podcast for the sake of leaving you with bullet points on self-improvement. We deeply believe that our lives are more complex than that. So we show up here on Sounds Good to ask big questions, dive into nuance, and learn from each other's stories. I had so much fun with this conversation, y'all. My hope is that you're going to leave this episode feeling inspired by the agency you have to make a difference. Ryan has a lot of heart and I learned a lot from his wisdom. So let's jump straight into this. I know that before we hit recording, you just said the name of the place you grew up in, but what was the town again? Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan. Man, what was it like growing up in, in Grand Rapids? Uh, it's a great place to grow up. It's, uh, it was one of those places where you can ride your bike. Tri- at least where, when, where I grew up in Grand Rapids, you could ride your bike pretty much anywhere starting at five years old. And so long as, so long as I was home by sundown, uh, that, was, that was sort of my life. And so it's funny. You look back at it now as an adult and that anywhere really truly only encompasses like you know six square blocks but those (laughs) when you're five (laughs) when you're five years old those six square blocks you know might as well be a a small metropolitan city and so uh, I really loved growing up there loved the sense of community loved how close you know it's Grand Rapids is one of those cities where it's sort of thinks that it's verging on being a metropolitan city. Yeah. Uh, Greater Grand Rapids technically has about a million people. Oh, wow. uh, but but it's it's similar to LA. It's a sprawl. So that's that's a real generous claim in terms of how many people are there. And so any area, any neighborhood that you grew up in Grand Rapids feels really close. Everyone feels like they know each other. Your all your parents, uh, all your friends' parents know each other, and so that was that was really my upbringing. What was your relationship with your family like growing up? So my parents, it was interesting. I it's funny. I talk about this a lot with team members and 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 a handful of friends, and some things that I often get asked to speak on when when it's all about uh, thinking back to your origins and what are some of the biggest things that shaped your environment and your upbringing. And one of the things that for me always comes up is. I had some very clear models of love uh, that were very pronounced throughout my life. My parents both were extremely dedicated parents, loved the heck out of uh, their three kids. I'm the youngest of three. It was my brother, Matthew, then my sister, then myself, and we're all three years apart. Um, 
my parents weren't necessarily meant to be together uh, about a year. I, I joke sometimes it's the truth, but I like to tell the joke about a year before they got married. Um, my, uh, my dad was the captain of a drinking team in college and my mom was in a convent. What? So, uh, that's unreal. Yeah. So put that together. Wow. Um, so they weren't, they weren't necessarily the likeliest of matches and both great people, both uh, really, truly good hearts, not necessarily meant to be together. But what happened is as a result of that, they raised us three kids with very different, unique perspectives and takes, you know, on, on life and on love. And we grew up as best friends. And so my brother, sister, and I, there was always sort of a line in our house, come and kids stick together. And mm. both our parents, you know, independently raised us a, to really truly love each other and to know friendship and, and deep bonds among siblings. Um, my dad used to do this thing where if we were like getting in fights, we'd have to do these one minute hugs. And you know, <laughs> I had to do that same thing in my family too. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. And you're sitting there and you're like pinching each other and screaming. And if the hug breaks, then you have to re-engage. And, <laughs> you know, a one minute hug may turn into 15 minutes of torture. But by the end of it, every single time without fail, you you know, we'd be sitting there laughing and, and it would shift. It would totally shift the tone. So, man, um, that's a good tool. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. The tools I, like I told you, I, I now have a 12 week old. And so I'm now thinking about like, what were the things that really worked growing up and how can I, how can I model the best behaviors? Man, that's so remarkable that your parents had such different backgrounds and I guess kind of years into your childhood, had they kind of united to be more similar together or were they still kind of opposite sides of the spectrum in many ways? Like what, I, I guess I'm curious if your childhood was uh, dichotomous or if they came together to kind of average each other out. Yeah, probably. I mean, dichotomous sounds severe. We were, yeah. we were very fortunate, um, but it was definitely a little bit of a, uh, you know, Machiavellian meets Mother Theresian in terms of uh, in terms of how they both raised us and, and taught us about things. My my dad's a real analytical thinker, lot of you know sort of raised and taught by the Jesuits, a lot of education on on life and critical thinking and analysis, and he was a CPA turned lawyer, so um, so a lot of lessons from a young age from him. My mother you know, coming, literally coming from a convent was just nothing but compassion. She's always been the woman who in a room will find the one person who, uh, who's alone or looks sad or can sort of, she's almost an empath. She could sort of seek out people based off of their needs and their emotional needs, and then just be there and be present and deliver that to them. And I remember growing up with her so many trips where she would basically chaperone disabled people on their grocery trips or uh or there was an ethiopian family that we sponsored who during a during a time of of a significant influx of refugees um they came in and lived with us and then ultimately uh you know we sort of chaperoned each each family took a different family and and so that was a lot of my mother's teachings and so both of these teachings came from a real earnest and sincere place of looking to guide each of us as kids, both together and individually in our, in our own development. Um, but they, but they mixed, they, the, the, the teachings balanced each other well, and they really sort of rounded out a lot of who I am. You know, I can't say that was that I'm, I'm, I'm a byproduct of my father or my mother. I'm, I'm definitely a blend of both. That's amazing. I think it's really cool that you are getting this full balance. And it, I always tell this story that I grew up in a small, tiny, conservative town, and then I moved to a, a larger, liberal city. And I love that I had that experience of both things. And I like to think that if I had grown up in the big city, I would have also, it would have been valuable for me to go and have that opposite experience as well, just because it uh, it has informed so much of this spectrum for me of, of kind of world experiences. And then you I don't know. I, th I think it's been a really, really helpful tool. And I love that you got to grow up with an experience like that in many ways. Yeah. What were, when you, when you made that move, what were the key things that you remembered were sort of like 
the fish out of water moments or the big shocks. I think I grew up in an environment where I, to not necessarily anybody's fault, I, I think that uh, culturally many people who you didn't know were othered. And so, you know, I, I didn't know people who had been homeless or had lived outside. I didn't know people who shared different beliefs than my family had. And and so I show up in downtown Portland, you know, I actually become friends with, and, and at one point, even for a little bit of time, live with a person who is, who didn't have a home. Uh, I started spending time on a daily basis with people who didn't share my belief systems. And just the whole thing was, was really helpful in that way of just being like, Oh, these are just, these are people like we, we laugh about jokes. Like we enjoy eating meals together. We've got stories that we can share over a drink, you know, all of these things, you know, were just things that were so relatable to, you know, the people that I grew up with as well. It's just that I just hadn't met them. I, I don't know. I feel like that was a big helpful thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's neat. Glad you had that transition. Thanks, man. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up, you know, growing up in this, in this great community with a great family where the sky's the limit for you as far as dreams go? <laughs> I, uh, maybe a little odd. I really wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, that's so specific. Where did that come from? Super specific. And it's, <laughs> and like to the degree that like every single one of my reports was like, I read autobiographies about neuro, uh, neurosurgeons, oh, that's every so single dorky one of my cool. like, I love that scientific <laughs> reports. There was a time, there was literally a time when I was in uh, fifth grade when we were doing a science fair where I had, and this sounds crazy to me now, but at the time it was for whatever reason, totally normal. I had like rollerbladed rollerbladed so let's let's just acknowledge, acknowledge that for a yeah, moment there so go. i had roller rollerbladed to an external science lab and somehow as a fifth grader had coaxed them to let me basically leave with a um with a cross section of a human brain what? which was then part of my which was then part of my like my science fair show so my parents got home that night and my siblings got home and there was like you know this tray in the fridge and it had like in my handwriting, like scribbled, like don't touch brain. <laughs> and that was, so yeah. So from a very, very young age, uh, I was fascinated with the brain, the, what it represents, what it meant. And, uh, and that was, <laughs> that was what I wanted to be. How long did clearly it didn't happen? Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, spoiler alert. You're not a neurosurgeon. How long did you stick with that, with that dream? I mean, that was a middle school, early high school. I think there was, I think it was probably because there was a, a, a guy that our family was close friends with who was a neurosurgeon and I just sort of held like wisdom in his, in high esteem. And, uh, and so you sort of randomly model certain things at different times in your life. Yeah. And that was one of the early, early models, uh, that I said, oh, that's a neat one. And then through high school, I think there was a shift that I sort of had towards storytelling, uh, and really loving the idea of storytelling and what it means. And then that brought me to college and, uh, and I went up to Stanford, but really while I was at Stanford, I was doing everything that I, it's funny like youth is wasted on the young and so was that <laughs> education because uh i spent all of my time when i was there focused on like the entertainment industry and hollywood and storytelling and so i did economics as an undergrad but every summer starting when i was 18 would go down to los angeles and just like by hooker by crook exist there on on whatever jobs I could get while interning at the studio systems and learning and absorbing as much knowledge as I possibly could uh you know through the through the different folks that were making some of the biggest movies so I did a, a summer with a guy named Sid Gannis who was the president of the Academy Awards and I did a a couple summers with a woman who was the chairwoman of Sony uh named Amy Pascal who was that time producing you know uh, Men in Black and oh, wow. Spider Man and Charlie's Angels and so many of these like massive hits and I just got to she really was um, awesome in terms of bringing me under her wing to to really see the process of movie making and how it got done at a studio level and then I did a summer with uh, a director named Spike Jones yeah and that was yeah and it was such a great learning experience because basically 
he had a cabinet full of all of his short films and then a tr- you know huge volume of films that he never or, or short films or just things he shot that he never released oh, and wow. so i just spent my entire summer just studying all of those things and uh so that finally by the time i graduated from stanford i was you know i was i was drinking the kool-aid i <laughs> just came right down to LA and 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 got into got into storytelling as quick as I could. I totally resonate on kind of the storytelling thing. That's much of the path that I uh, kind of pivoted down at the end of high school and into college. And for me, I had kind of just like you said that you had kind of seen a model or a template, or you had a, a mentor of sorts who inspired you kind of in the neurosurgeon direction, I had that in the storytelling world where there were people who were kind of, uh, they, they created a model of, of how I could see my life going down that path. Did you have somebody like that for you who maybe was your inspiration behind that pivot over to storytelling? Hmm, I'm trying to think about that. I mean, it was a lot. I was always deeply fascinated by like movies. I remember ever since I was a little kid. To this day, the thing that gets me most excited when you're watching a movie isn't actually the movie itself. It's the opener of the, of the studio. You know, if it's that Columbia, oh, it was yeah. the old ones. Remember like the tri-star of the horse that would come in or totally. if it was like the Pixar lamp or DreamWorks with the little boy fishing off the moon. And there was just this feeling. I remember like a deep, body sensation and and mental sensation that would come over where like that's the portal to your imagination that's the portal to some story that you're about to uh engage in that's going to take you to who knows where some far off place and um and teach you a lot of lessons and give you laughs and and tears and everything in between and so for me movies had always played a deep role in so much of my enjoyment growing up. And then I just sort of met more and more people who were great storytellers. There wasn't one, but that I think it was those summers, you know, that I spent time in the studio system, but that summer with Spike Jones, where I really started studying, not just him, but all different directors. And then I started reading there are a couple of great books on like old Hollywood and new Hollywood and films in the seventies and eighties. Um, and what happened during that time. And then Really more so now, I think when I was younger coming up, it was a little bit probably more like the Tinseltown aspects of Hollywood that really attracted me. And now it's much more the Joseph Campbell aspects. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Joseph Campbell, but he's a uh, he's a guy who studied basically, he, he's no longer with us, but he's a remarkable professor back in his day who studied mythology across every different culture around the world and basically started to find throughout all of these different mythologies, the through lines that were similar between cultures and the shared stories that we have, you know, regardless of whether or not you were growing up in a native American tribe or, uh, or in a Hindu community or in, you know, modern day Grand Rapids, Michigan. And there are these very similar themes and stories that exist. And he sort of wrote this book called, a uh, hero with a thousand faces, which laid out a hero's journey. Where if you look at Star Wars, anything from Star Wars to any Pixar film today, they all follow this same model of a hero's journey. And and that work really got me engaged at a, at an even deeper level because it started to sort of show the universe universality of uh, of all of our journeys as as individual people and and how those journeys can be portrayed through story. Oh, that's incredible. And I, I love that book. It is so dense, but so good. I guess I'm curious, did you have a vision for what you wanted to do with storytelling? You know, as you were going through this process and, you know, getting these opportunities in Hollywood and LA, did you know what purpose you wanted these stories to tell? Or did you just you cared about the art of storytelling, (laughs) man. I I wish, I wish, (laughs) I I wish I knew. I'm sure my parents wish I knew what I wanted to do with this too. Uh, uh, I was interested in people and I was interested in stories and, uh, and I had a lot of directors that I thought were putting out, you know, really groundbreaking creative stuff. And that was probably the extent of it, you know, to some degree, I'm sure I was 
to, to some degree, probably to a large degree, I'm sure when I was in my young 20s, I was, you know, much more self-focused and self-centered. And, and, and so I'm sure the stories played a role in terms of like who I thought I was at that point in time. But, um, but even cutting through that, you know, what stories represented for me at that point in time was just a deeper connection with human beings. And I think that's the, that's the through line that drew me to it is like that feeling that you get when you cut through the pleasantries with a person and really dig into who they are and what their story is. And that's a difficult type of conversation that is to some degrees, you know, I feel like more and more in our, uh, amid our modern technology, we're losing that style of conversation. But what movies, TV shows, and even short form stories do is they give us a way to reconnect with that and to connect with people. And so I think at the end of it, while I use the word story and storytelling, it, it was really about inspiration and connection and, and tapping into that feeling of being inspired as a human being and using that inspiration to connect with people and the virtuous cycle that that creates. And so through all of this, kind of what were the next steps that led to eventually creating Omaze? I guess I'm curious to hear you bridge that gap. Yeah, so hindsight's always 2020. <laughs> uh, you know, you can you can paint you can paint a really nice story when you're looking back at it. I wish that while I was doing it, I could say, "Ah, oh, this was the natural next step that A led to B led to C." <laughs> oh, I feel you. But instead, it, it felt probably more like you know, A led to watermelon led to uh, who knows what else. <laughs> like, <laughs> but what it was was I you know, so I started in in those internships. I had a friend from Stanford, Matt, who's my co-founder at Omaze now, and and we both came down to Los Angeles with that shared passion for storytelling and and then uh, lived with a bunch of other guys too that all sort of shared it in similar ways. And, and we got involved in a lot of different projects. So it started off much more commercial, um, music videos, film and TV, but then very quickly sort of transitioned over into this space of cause content. So I was the first director on a thing called Live Earth. It was uh, the largest concert ever thrown. It was in 2007, and it was spearheaded by Al Gore all around uh, climate change. So 150 music superstars all on the same day. And that was, I think, the first time that I saw that things that I was directing and and a project that I had a hand in, uh, even, you know, albeit small at that point in time in my career, had a much larger global stage that it got to play on. And that really got me excited to see to see that it could connect to something that was tangible, that had real impact in the world. It wasn't just frivolous. And I love that. I was real inspired by that. And, you know, in my early 20s, I'd written down on a legal pad, you know, that before the end of my 20s that I wanted to spend at least a year interviewing some of the brightest minds on the planet. So when I was 26, I set out uh, right after Live Earth and I spent a year interviewing a couple hundred Nobel Prize winners and MacArthur Genius Grant recipients and Pulitzers That's and incredible. Uh, wow. Fields Medal winners. Yeah. And how'd you pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really simple. I, I, cut a, I, cu- I got a couple people. I was coming right off Live Earth. And so I got a couple real interesting interviews at the front end. I, a guy named John Hennessy, who's now the executive chairman of the Alphabet Corporation, which is, oh. which is the holding company for, for Google. Yeah. And uh, at the time, he was the president of Stanford. So guys like Hennessy or, um, or Noam Chomsky, who, uh, who's well-known in both politics and, and for his work in, uh, in the evolution of language and, and sort of creating an understanding of how language evolves, which was also used in computer programming. Um, there was a woman named Lisa, uh, Randall who, uh, who proposed string theory. She's a well-known physicist. So I, I went to a handful of these real interesting folks and I started interviewing them on these six questions that, um, were really sort of boggling my mind at the time, real big six, you know, six big philosophical questions, but they were the questions where in my twenties where I was essentially trying to form my own, you know, mental constitution. I wanted to. I wanted to rely on other people to to help me do that. And on the heels of those interviews, I'd tell them that if they liked what I'd talked with them about and they liked my questions, they'd recommend the next three people. So I went oh, three, nine, wow. twenty-seven, and 
you know, within a year I had a couple hundred and, uh, and it was, uh, it was a really, really intense year for me. Um, because it was, I started that year, I think thinking that I knew a lot and, um, and probably in my twenties, like feeling myself. And then within a year, just realized like how little I knew by comparison to these folks who'd spent their entire lives going so deep on any individual topic and just how small, my scope of reference had been for how much there is to learn about the world. And so it was an incredibly, incredibly humbling year and really taught me a couple key lessons that totally changed my trajectory in life. Isn't it remarkable how like really good questions can make you feel dumber? <laughs> like I, I love, it's such a healthy thing to be like, oh my gosh, th- there's so much more than the things that I know. And I thought that I, I was impressive and, and maybe I'm, I'm far less impressive than I think I am. Yeah. And it's a, uh, and, and thank God we have that opportunity. You yeah. Know? For real. Uh, so grateful. Because, I love it. because we learn a lot more when we listen than, than when we righteously sort of speak. And it perpetuates humility and more questions and more learning and more growing and more humility. It's a good cycle to get into. Yeah, it really is. I had listened to uh, one of the one of the things that allowed me to get into that cycle was after the first ten interviews I did, I went back and listened to them, and I realized that at, like all the most critical moments of these interviews, I was interrupting the thinker with what I thought they were trying to say, hmm. and so I was just totally killing the interview and preventing myself from being able to basically learn or take in a new nugget of wisdom. And, and after those first 10, I really wanted, I was pulling my hair out. I wanted to shoot myself. So then I had to train myself. It was totally a retraining, but to just to learn how to interview properly, which is to ask a question and then quietly sit back and, and allow the answer, sit with the discomfort of silence and allow the interviewee to fill that space. And then as they give sort of that first low hanging fruit response, then say, you know, and why do you think that? Or, and then what happened? And, you know, help me understand that more. And then just really digging into the the true marrow of the conversation and beginning to understand who they are. And for me, that was a combination of both that approach, but I'm also someone who I, I can't really understand who a person is without understanding their origin story and knowing where they came from. Because I think that that determines so much of what we do in our lives and how we think about the world and what our perspective is and why we end up um, you know, pursuing whatever endeavor we may be on. That's so remarkable though. And I love that, that a lot of that, I mean, I hate the word hustle, but I love that that f- truly came from a place of you uh, owning that pursuit and that you really leaned into, this is an opportunity to grow and of course, to continue meeting these amazing people, what kind of doors opened up from getting to have all of those amazing conversations? It's interesting for me to look back at because what, when I was in the middle of it, um, it was really, it was also very like emotionally tasking because I was doing this, I was learning all this stuff, but I was also like couch, I mean, I was in my mid twenties, I was like couch surfing from different friends' houses to be able to do this for a year. And, uh, and everyone seemed to get a kick out of it and think it was interesting and neat. Um, but while I was doing it, I was watching, you know, a handful of my friends getting director roles at, uh, you know, this new company called YouTube or this new company, you know, called Facebook. And so I was watching this parallel, these parallel journeys of my friends who were, uh, who were really taking on, you know, their own interesting roles. And I was sort of sitting there wondering, you know, am I completely making a mistake and wasting my life right now? Um, and they were looking at me and saying things like, it's so cool that you're doing this. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, thank you for saying that as you have your, you know, lovely paycheck and I'm spending a year <laughs> not, not quite sure what's going to come of this. Um, but the doors that I think that it opened is it, I think it gave me a deeper foundation for understanding how I think about the world. And I took, I took some time, you know, a couple months after I finished all those interviews to really watch them and dig in and transcribe them and, and internalize a lot of the lessons uh, so that I wasn't just parroting things that other people said, but I sort of formed my own perspectives um, on the different matters. And then from there, uh, that was, you know, one of my key steps, you know, I, I mentioned Matt before Matt had, had been on his own journey during that time. And, and we 
it oftentimes worked together on some of these um, on some other projects, and and that brought us back to this idea of really wanting to be in social impact and create something that had a, a deeper, you know, higher meaning and resonance with the world as opposed to just selling ourselves out for any next gig. And we'd worked on a couple more campaigns together and then realized that, uh, that we didn't necessarily have the model that was going to allow us to do that in the impact space successfully. And we took a big step back and sort of surveyed the landscape of cause content and saw that that was something very endemic to the space. There are a lot of people putting on really big concerts and conferences and to-dos, but being able to take fans that were coming to these things and, and engage them at a deep emotional level and essentially convert them into someone who um, is, is going to take action on behalf of that cause for their lifetime was much more difficult. And so short of having the answer, we went back to business school and spent two years just trading ideas back and forth. And while we were there, uh, there was a we were invited to a charity gala. It was the National Boys and Girls Club of America, and they were honoring Magic Johnson. And I mentioned, you know, Grand Rapids. I grew up in Grand Rapids, 45 minutes away from Magic. Was a huge Magic fan when he was playing for Michigan State, uh, right down the street. And then Matt had grown up in Los Angeles and was a massive Lakers fan. And so we're sitting there, and they're auctioning off the chance to hang out with Magic sit courtside at the Lakers game and it's this dream once in a lifetime experience. And so, you know, our hands shoot up right off the bat and it's uh, 50 bucks and then a hundred bucks and then it's 500 bucks and then it's a thousand. <laughs> and when you're in B school on loans, a thousand bucks, your month's rent. And so our hands sort of sheepishly dropped and then it went to 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 and, and closed there. And, uh, you know, to, to, to throw some salt on the wound, I knew the guy that bought it at 15K and he wasn't even a Magic fan. He was a no. Clippers fan. Oh. Yeah. So uh, so we were driving home that night and talking about it. We said, you know, imagine if for $10, anybody had the chance to win this incredible once-in-a-lifetime experience. You know, how many more people would have participated? How, many, how much more money could the Boys and Girls Club have raised? How much more awareness could they have garnered? Yeah. And that was really the 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 impetus for or omaze that was the, that was its origin story wow and then where did the name omaze come from yeah so we had a uh, we had a friend who whenever anything was bigger than uh, amazing she would say it's oh amazing <laughs> and we always just thought that was funny and then when we were looking for a name it, it totally fit so that's, that's where amazing it came from. i was half worried i was going to be like oh maybe it's such a good name maybe you guys just like hired an agency to come up with the name and stuff and it's not going to be a good story and i love that it's just like it's so personal so good yeah um, yeah okay what were those early days like i guess because you have this idea for a company but there's a big difference between an idea and actually proof of concept you know actually creating something that that gives back what was kind of the 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 beginning stage of this like struggle total <laughs> struggle oh i feel you <laughs> again uh, you know like hindsight's 2020 20, and everybody likes to tell the glorious story after the fact but like we were we were really creating something that had never been created before uh people we, we had to go out and raise our first initial round of capital on essentially an idea that that no one knew if it was even possible and so including, you know, at times us, we believed, but, but we hadn't done it. So the mechanics of it was, was new to us. And so in that first year, you know, there, even our investors wondered like, is sweepstakes going to be looked at as scammy? Will celebrities want to get involved? Will it actually benefit the charities? You know, how do you, how do you take your storytelling and layer it onto a tech platform? And so for that first year, a lot of our experiences really struggled. Um, you know, we had our, our first experience that we ever launched was the opportunity to be a guest host on Cupcake Wars. <laughs> and uh, so we have a, a wonderful friend, Justin Williman, who was, uh, who was the host of that show and a, a wonderful human being. But not a whole lot of people were like massive, massively into Cupcake Wars, <laughs> uh, you know, at least on a level that was going to help raise tens of thousands of dollars. So that one raised $700. Yeah, it's kind of a show that you watch more passively while you like cook 
a meal that's right than it is yeah. something that you're like crazy excited that's about. right and uh and so that one raised 700 dollars. we did another one which was the chance to play battleship against four-star admiral mullen uh <laughs> who's you know an incredibly decorated admiral but it turns out doesn't have like a massive social media following <laughs> or any at all uh, um and so we really had to go through a lot of these learning lessons but we were you know just hustling as, as hard as we could with past relationships and people to try and convince them that this was going to work and then lo and behold we did a parks and rec experience that did twenty thousand dollars and then we did a, a john stewart campaign that did sixty thousand and then a lincoln park that did a hundred thousand and then we had a espn campaign that did over two hundred thousand dollars in 24 hours and you know at the time we weren't even sure if our site was broken but we started realizing we were getting a lot of traction and then we did a Breaking Bad, uh, the chance to attend the finale of Breaking Bad. You got uh, to ride in a hazmat suit. That's a suit. big deal. You get to ride in a Winnebago. Yeah, it's a super big deal. You got to ride in a Winnebago wearing a hazmat suit with Aaron Paul and Brian Cranston. And that did $1.7 million. And we were like, okay, we're on the map. Like this, this model works. Wow. And then we did a Star Wars. And that did, uh, it was the chance to be in Star Wars Episode 7, which was just the... Oh, that's a huge deal. Oh, incredible. And it was the, you know, it was a collaborative effort of J.J. Uh, Abrams, who's the director of Star Wars, and, and Katie McGrath, uh, who's an incredibly brilliant wife, um, who's, in, who's very philanthropic and, uh, and has an incredible mind for impact, and then Lucasfilm and Disney. And, and they all came together and, and put this on. And it ended up raising four point two six million dollars wow. in you know about a little over eight weeks, and had donors from well over one hundred and twenty six countries. And we were like, okay, this this thing really works, and and we were off to the races. Man, was there a specific moment where you broke out of the hardness of starting something new, and you kind of looked around and you're like, oh wait, this is working, and I'm. I'm feeling a lot better about all of this. Was there a transition moment for you? Will there be? <laughs> um, like, I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's encouraging to hear. That's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah. You know, when you're doing this type of thing, I still feel like, we still feel like we've only scratched the surface of what there is to be done. So I don't, I don't think that unless the company had a major event or, uh, or raised a billion dollars for charity, like we'll feel like we've made it. Like we're, we still feel like we're on the treadmill of trying to change the entire space of impact and trying to prove ourselves and prove that this model can really scale. I mean, the individual giving in the U S is a $330 billion market and only 7% of that's online. Oh, and wow. so that just goes to show you, how much opportunity there is to really change this space. And uh, while we feel as though, you know, we're re really leading the charge within this, this niche of impact of experiential marketing um, and once in a lifetime experiences, and we built out, you know, a managed marketplace to do that, there's still so much more to go. And we really, we view that every audience is an opportunity for impact. And we've got an incredible, really, truly incredible young an inspired team that comes to work every single day because they're inspired to change the world. And, uh, and so, no, we don't, we don't feel like we've made it. We feel like we are making it, but there's still so much more to be done. That is so good to hear that. I'm sure there's so many people listening right now who are working to bring something to life that they believe in and they're passionate about and they see your success story and they're like, well, if I could just do that, and it's great to think that at every stage you could just continue thinking about that. And you can also just be encouraged by the, the, by the success that you have had. You know, obviously you have had an impact, even if your goal is to have a greater impact. With that said, what are some of the impact stories that have been making it all worth it? What are some of the things that you've gotten to see on the, you know, on the organization side that you're really encouraged and inspired by? I think first and foremost, the thing that we like to see is that there are so many remarkable charities out there that are more than ever needed um, as, you know, as government defunds social programs, as globalization continues marching forward and this disparities between different groups of populations, you know, around the world and even nationally um, really come to light. 
these nonprofits, these 501c3s play a really critical role in, um, in establishing a more equitable, equitable life for, for individuals who, you know, more often than not, the vast majority of the time find themselves in a position of hardship by, you know, nothing other than, than chances than a roll of the dice in terms of where they ended up. And so first and foremost, being able to see that those charities, what they should be doing is what they do. And what they do so well uh, is to be able to keep doing boots on the ground work Mm. and to not have to worry about trying to fundraise and to not have to worry about how do they market and how do they reach new people and instead worry about how do they continue helping, you know, veterans returning home to continue serving with their skills in different ways, you know, perhaps as natural disaster first relief responders or to allow kids who otherwise do not have access to, you know, uh, a healthy, uh, safe education can suddenly be given, you know, the the tools and, and uh, resources that they need to be able to compete in the 21st century workplace or to help mothers, you know, end the transmission of HIV from mother to child. So, so whatever the charity may be doing, our first and, and best result is seeing that we're able to help them continue doing that. Now, the way that we do it is you have these really creative, remarkable, genius human beings, you know, otherwise known as uh, oftentimes celebrities or influencers. <laughs> and historically that, you know, that, that word sort of been taken over by, uh, you know, a lot of magazines and the internet to mean something different than, than what we think it means. We, we, we look at celebrities as these people who, because of their intelligence and incredible creative powers, they've built up a community of people who look to them and who look up to them and really want to see what they care about. And so these celebrities have an opportunity to really shine their light on a lot of these causes and the work of these causes. And so what we've basically done is created a bridge where you can have the chance to have a once in a lifetime experience with some of these folks, you know, whether or not it's the chance to hang out with Amelia Clark on the set of Game of Thrones or to have George Clooney sit across from you for one minute and stare into your eyes and compliment you <laughs> or, uh, or the chance to ride shotgun with Lewis Hamilton in a Formula One race, you know, whatever that experience may be, these are things that otherwise never would have been made available to the public at large. And now fans and donors can really get behind the people that they care about to impact the world and, and create a net net win you know, across the board. And it's very rare that, 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 that companies have the opportunity to do that. And so we feel very blessed and grateful that we found ourselves in this position where we can create that type of positive exchange. It's interesting because you are at the epicenter of kind of this shift in giving and this shift in generosity and this shift in how we relate with nonprofits. I'm very curious what, what trends you're almost seeing in the way that people want to give back. So I think there are a couple of different trends. Um, you know, one of the one of the more obvious trends is that 10, 20 years ago, it used to be the case that there was sort of this model, the old model of like you went from employee to employer to investor to philanthropist. And so I remember, you know, when I was like growing up, like, you know, a really wealthy person was a philanthropist. And if, you know, if, if you knew anyone else who claimed to be a philanthropist, that didn't really make sense. Or it was almost like a joke. Like you'd hold up a monocle to your eye and say, yeah, I'm a philanthropist. And, and now anyone can be a philanthropist. Now, because of the shifting trends and the accessibility that's been made uh, available through micro giving, you don't have. You can be an employee and a philanthropist all at once, and so that has really shifted. Um, and I think the other thing that's really shifted is there's been a shift in storytelling. And so storytelling over this last twenty years has gone from something that was very unidirectional to something that is much more immersive. And people, viewers, you and I, all feel a much greater sense of agency in the stories that we participate in. And so you see that, you know, uh, they ail us the, the, the ice bucket challenge. That was a story that, yeah. that took place. That, that was a story that spread. And people wanted to both be a part of that story by filming themselves doing it, as well as have agency within that story by making donations to, to fund that cause. 
And so I think that that shift of anyone being able to be a philanthropist at the same time as people now having a much greater degree of agencies in the stories and the narratives that make up our lives are two things that have happened simultaneous, simultaneously that are entirely changing the face of, of philanthropy and impact right now. What do you think is going to come next then? I think so a lot a lot more agency. I think that I think that what we're seeing is and you've seen this regardless of your politics, you've seen this after the last election, a couple of things. One is, you know, when you have less than 20 human beings uh having approximately, you know, half the wealth of of the world, then there's a there's an imbalance that that exists. Um and I remember recently uh listening to um the head of the world health organization say that you know if if there's a 10 percent shift in salary you know at, at a local level and people are aware of it then generally they can they can be okay with it once you start going you know higher or lower th- higher than a 10 percent shift between you know you and another person you start to get a little bit antsy but what globalization has really done is it's really expose the fact that you know that 10 percent shift is a much higher shift that's taken place internationally that there are people in third world countries that are now seeing for the you know and this isn't just for the first time this past year but this is over this last 20 years just seeing the level of disparity between income that they exist in and and first world countries and even within first world countries there are people you know in the united states who are seeing the disparities of income and that's also taking place and evolving at a rapid rate right now as, as technology continues to, to shrink the middle class and create a greater divide between a, a much smaller select few of haves and a much greater base of have-nots. Then all of those things put pressure on a system that requires a lot of organizations to come in and create equity where there might not be. And so I think that it's a long-winded way of saying that in our case, in our model, we see that people who do have the means really want to take a much greater agency and, and role and be a, be a role player, be a protagonist of this story of humanity by helping their fellow brother and sister to have another, I have a shot at life like they've had. Where do you see your role in all of this as this is growing? You know, how, how do you want to continue to to play a part in this encouraging story of people wanting to take agency over, you know, solutions that they want to see in the world? Yeah, it's a good question, Brandon. Um, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned we did that star Wars campaign. And when we did that, uh, I had a real unique opportunity to sit down for a short while with, with JJ Abrams and Katie McGrath. And like I said, they're two just of the most giving, intelligent, bright human beings I've ever met. Uh, you should really watch JJ's career because I think it's going to take off eventually. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, and he said this thing. He said, uh, you know, for a story to truly be great, the protagonist has to have something that they want to have happen with every fiber of their being and a very clear tragedy that will result if it doesn't. And so when I think about my own life, I sit there and I've really started to, to put my own life through that lens of, you know, we are all the protagonist of our own stories. We are all the protagonist of our own real life narrative that's taking place. And how do we define, for me, how do I clearly define the thing that I really want to have happen with every fiber of my being and the very clear tragedy that will result if it doesn't? And and I'm continually defining that, but I know that it really centers on inspiration and connection. I know that it centers on knowing that that my life is as meaningful as my ability to create meaning for other people as well, to the degree that I'm capable of, um, and and to accept meaning that's created for me by those people in return. So that's that's my own personal journey as a company. What Omaze uh, is based on is this higher purpose that we serve world changers. And our mission is to build a community that leverages the power of storytelling and technology to transform lives. And so that really is, I think, plays into that idea of what's the thing that we hope for with every fiber of our being? Well, it's it's to serve world changers and it's that the world changers win. And what's the clear tragedy that results if it doesn't? It's it's that, you know, lives are not improved. 
And so there's a little bit of a parallel path there between what I'm trying to do as an individual and between what the company's trying to do, which I suppose there, there probably should be. <laughs> Man, that I love the clarity in which you speak to all of this. And I think kind of as a way to wrap up this conversation, because this has been so inspiring, is for people who are listening. Once a year, I, I think clearly. And then the yeah, the other 364 days are just a complete mess. Well, I'm glad I caught you on the right <laughs> yeah. day because this has been a good conversation. Yeah. As kind of a final question to wrap up this episode, for people who are listening and they want to innovate in the way that they tell stories, in the way that they make a difference in the world, they want to be a part of this greater narrative, what advice would you offer them on how to bring this thing to life in the same way that, you know, you've brought this thing to life? What advice? So I'm careful not to dole out advice as much as I can. Um, I like to ask questions a lot more than I like to give advice because I know that the second I catch myself giving advice, I'm probably going to get slapped with some realization that I'm, uh, you know, riding too high on my own horse. But um, I think the question that I would ask myself, uh, if I can take that, that, that advice prompt, is what is the story that's taking place out in the world right now that is bigger than just yourself? What is the story that's taking a place that has a, a, a large amount of impact on many more human beings than just you? And then what role might you be able to play in that story? And when you look across the course of history, every major icon, cultural icon, leader, uh, revolutionary, reformist, um, change maker has been someone who's been connected to a story that's much bigger than just themselves. Someone who has played a role in servicing that story, you know, sometimes by luck, sometimes by design, most often a combination of the two, we're able to rise up and essentially help shift that story and, and accelerate it and usher it along. Uh, and that's actually one of the things when I interviewed all those thinkers that I really learned from them was that the thing that had made them so great and why they won accolades like Nobel Prizes and, and such were that not because they were just so great themselves, but because as a result of their work, millions more have been able to accomplish new and, and higher feats in this world. And so it really is one of those um, scenarios of, uh, you know, on the shoulders of giants. And so I would just suggest to people who are trying to figure out what they're trying to do, how do you think not in terms of yourself, but in terms of a much larger, a 10x, 100x, 1000x vision of humanity, a plan for humanity that needs to get accomplished? And then what role might you be able to play in that? And that's a big, broad question. And that's a little scary at first, but... You know, once you let your mind percolate on that and then begin to get strategic in terms of breaking it down into areas of focus and breaking it down into next steps, then some of those answers may become more clear. Man, I love that Ryan has spent his life wanting to build a community that leverages the power of story and technology to transform lives. I think we can all be inspired by that. You can find and follow Ryan on Instagram and Twitter, and you should absolutely check out what he's doing at omaze at omaze.com. Spend a few minutes looking for an experience you're thrilled about and consider giving some money to a meaningful cause. And who knows, you might just end up with the experience of a lifetime. In fact, if you do, you have to tell me. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around. You'd also love my conversations with Ben Nemton and Taylor Tippett, both wildly inspiring individuals who have creative and insightful ways to challenge the norm and make lasting impacts in the world. You can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure that you hit subscribe to keep on getting more inspiring conversations with incredible people delivered to your phone while you sleep. And for those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast, please consider supporting the show by telling a friend about the show or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. This podcast is created by me. Brandon Harvey is a part of Good, Good, Good. 
a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show, and Christy Karen Brock offers production support. You can get lots of hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at goodgoodgoodco. We also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. It's called The Good Newspaper, and we actually recently released our newest issue. If you haven't already checked it out, it is so much fun. It's got pages and pages of stories that are full of real messy hope, and you can order it today. Check it out in the link in our show notes, or just visit goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and take some time to think about how you want to show up in the world for something that is bigger than yourself. Move towards a new sense of agency that what you do matters. Sound good?